So I'm really proud to introduce our final speakers of the day. The event, I should note, is sponsored by the Society of Genealogists, which I think is quite mm. apt given that we're looking at um, dynasties from um, the world. But um, first of all, I'll introduce Dr. Gus Casey Hayford. Gus is a British um, curator, cultural historian, broadcaster, and lecturer. He currently he's currently the director of VNA East and formerly the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art in Washington, D.C. He was appointed an officer of the Order of the British Empire in June 2018 for his services to arts and culture. A regular filmmaker and broadcaster, Gus has presented an award-winning South Bank show on African art, produced do the documentary um, on Channel 4 about Chris of Philly, and presented sev uh, several series um, on BBC about African culture, including one of my favourite programmes, which I hope is still on there and accessible, Lost Kingdoms of Afri Africa, um, and the accompanying book of the same name. Simon Sebag Montefiore um, is a best-selling and prize-winning writer of history and fiction books whose books are published in 48 languages. He's the author, author of the international bestsellers Stalin, The Court of the Red Tsar, Jerusalem, The Biography, Young Stalin, Catherine the, Catherine the, the Great, oh my gosh, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce this. This name. It doesn't matter how you pronounce it. <laughs> Potemkin. Is, Potemkin. Yeah, Catherine Potemkin. the Great and Potemkin. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the Romanovs um, and Voices of History, as well as the Moscow Trilogy of Novels, The Royal Rabbits of London, um, and uh, for children. He's won prizes for both history and fiction, and he's here today to speak about his latest book, The World of Family History. Gus, Simon, over to you. Thank you so much, Thank you. And can I just begin by saying thank you to Rebecca and the whole HisFest team and everyone at the British Library who have hosted us today and, and tomorrow. I mean, it just what a fantastic event. I mean, a great programme, but also just the way in which you put this together um, and the greeting, just the quality of the sessions. It's absolutely glorious to be here. And, and I am so... Delighted. I'm a bit of a kind of a fanboy, and um, you can see that I've tried to kind of cut my hair in the, you know, in the same, <laughs> and that this is the only man with a name with with more syllables than mine. So I'm absolutely <laughs> delighted to meet you, Simon, and congratulations. What? Um, what? Well, uh, I, I I must say that's such a that's it's, it's so nice. And I also, I mean, obviously, I have modelled my whole look on you, <laughs> um, and um, and the hairdos <laughs> are essential. <laughs> Um, which I'm very proud of, but also I also just want to thank you, Rebecca, because this is a. I, I try and do a, a festival myself. It's incredibly hard, and this has um, such an impressive um, list of speakers, not including us, of course, <laughs> but certainly not including me. But amazing people, and um, so congratulations and thanks for having me, oh. really be, and thanks for coming, everybody. Yes, thank you so much. So. The Trumps, the royal family, Succession, Game of Thrones. I mean, the, the kind of, the frame, the, the paradigm, family, it's, it's everywhere and it's such an effective way of talking about so many subtle and complex things. And Simon, you've grabbed it as, as, as a paradigm and you've helped us to use it as a way of navigating some of the kinds of huge areas of history, some of the sorts of things that are subtle, introducing me to lots of new things. And this is an incredible, incredible book. How did you go about constructing something of this level of complexity? Um, of well, well, first of all, you know, that you're, thank you. I mean, first of all, the family concept is just is simple. It's just that, I mean, obviously, it's the essential unit of human, of human life and probably always will be. Um, it's also a political unit, a social unit. Um, a political contrivance. Um, it's many things. It can be a state. It can be. A, it, it can be um, just a mother and a father. And um, and I just use it as a tether, exactly as you described, as a harness to um, to anchor the great and to harness the great uh, movements of history. <coughs> but also um, the great challenge of the book, like this, is to tell a world history that combines the sort of span of global history. Um, with the intimacy, the grit, the juice of, of ordinary human life. And so many world histories have lots of commodities and 
pandemics and technical um, achievements and don't really miss out the humans which, who are so fascinating. And of course, the humans also do have some influence too themselves on what's happening. So that was the concept. But doing it, um, as you know yourself, when you write one of these books, you know, you write a sort of a one-line um, proposal that says, I'd like to write a world history. And if you're lucky, sometimes the publisher says, OK, do it, commissioned. And then about sort of six months later, they say, you know, what's the idea? <laughs> and you don't, you know, you, you have to write the damn thing. And so that's the great challenge. So you're absolutely right to say that it was, it was a sort of crushing um, uh, test, really, to write it. The most, it's definitely the most challenging thing I've ever tried to do. And it did almost kill me. Um, writing it. I mean, there was barely, a, I mean, I, I was barely a night went past when I could actually sleep without um, waking up worrying about something. I mean, there was, the, there was the terrible night I woke up at three in the morning and, and, and said to myself, oh my God, I've left out Jesus Christ, <laughs> um, for example. Um, I was so keen to put other things in that, you know, aren't, you don't expect. Another night I woke up and, and said, ah, Mozart, you know. So, so my family life com was completely destroyed by this book. But I, I ran it along my own bookshelf and I kind of measured it up, Lord of the Rings, Anna Karenina, you know, like all of those huge Russian novels about families. Yes. And that this, this, your book is every bit as kind of, as, 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 as complex, as thick, as subtle, but also just as long as well. I mean, the, the writing, the, the technical writing of getting up every day and kind of facing into kind of something which was this long. How did you, how was Well, you're that? right. I mean, not that I'd ever, I mean, I love all those books that you've mentioned, um, those masterpieces, but actually the, my approach to it was novelistic in the yes. sense that, um, you know, you didn't want, one of the things you mustn't do was have say meanwhile all the time. That was bad. <laughs> I think there's only one meanwhile in the book. Um, another thing you must, well, you know, you, you mustn't do is just have huge sections like a Wikipedia entry, because yes. that would defeat the point. Uh, one of the points of it was to have the feeling of contingency, of um, unpredictability um, that you have um, in, in real life. Um, the feeling that there are many, many crises and things going on at the same time, and you have no idea which one is going to you know, blow up. Um, whether you're Louis XIV or Genghis Khan or Rishi Sunak, um, you know, there are many, many world crises happening. And you, know, it's, it's, you worry about one, and everyone's obsessed with one, and then it's another one that blows up. You know, Sudan, for example, you know, this yes. week. Um, so, so I wanted that feeling. I wanted to catch the messiness of life, but also it has to, has to read, has to be dramatic. So um, the idea was to weave it all in. It's interwoven. And I, one of the things I took great delight in was having very quick, almost kind of instant switches from sort of, you know, Cromwell's... Um, from Cromwell's sort of court in London to the court in, you know, in China or whatever. Um, so that's part of it. But you're right. I mean, the actual writing of it w was, a, was, was, was daunting. And um, I got up every morning at dawn. I, I lived um, a bit like in The Godfather. You remember that scene where, where, the, where um, the, uh, the, the family, um, they go to the mattresses and um, they basically live in a kind of house, just sleeping um, with their guns beside them, <laughs> um, waiting to be attacked, and they just wait for the war to be over. And it was a bit like that. I sort of went to the mattresses, or, or lived in a sort of rather monk-like way. Um, and my family went to the countryside, and I just lived there, and I sort of got up at dawn at 6 o'clock every morning, and I just wrote all day. And I immersed myself, and I read nothing um, except what was in the book, except at night when I... I read all the no I, I love reading thrillers. So yes. I read all the novels of Michael Connolly. I don't know if any of you read that. <laughs> um, the Bosch novels, absolutely brilliant. Um, so it was very challenging. And of course, my family are just sick of that. They don't want to ever hear the word <laughs> world again. Um, but the research for something like this, where it's. Because it, it, it's not just it's it's the ex expected dynasties. It's about no. it's about doctors. It's about it's about the sort of people on the ground who are living life right at the kind of on the front lines of things, as well as the people who are orchestrating huge sorts of um, passages. Of it's it's fascinating right. how you change. Yeah, um, that's what I try and do. I mean, obviously, some of the families are dynasties and royal dynasties that you've yes. heard of and are very familiar with. Um, I mean, one of my one of my 
early kind of... One of the reasons I chose family was, first of all, because there were women in it, which we might discuss later. Women yes. are so much are so important in family, and female history is so interesting and so neglected. But also, um, but also because of diversity yes. and the wish, the, wish, the wish to treat every part of the world equal, really equally. So in this book, I mean, there is Europe. Of course, Europe is hugely important. Um, but also, I mean, I think there's more... I think it's more diverse than any world history written before. Um, and, you know, there's more of Africa, more of Asia, more of South, South America. Um, so that, that was also part of it. Um, and the great thing about family is I wanted... When I, when I looked at royal dynasties, I literally wanted to treat the royal family of, of the Asante or the, yes. um, or the Benin or, or the Gaza Empire in Mozambique. I wanted to treat those people exactly as I would treat... Um, Frederick the Great, or Catherine the Great, or, or Elizabeth the First, and that's that was the sort of basic one of the basic rules of the book, and I think that's that adds to it. We haven't got your family in there, <laughs> um, but, but, you, but almost. I mean, you are related to some of those, aren't some I of am, the fam yes. Some of the dynasties in the book. I mean, Gus is actually royalty in oh, a no. way. But your family, though, is fascinating. Your, we your, both, can, we both can you have tell interesting us, families, we do, don't we? But can you tell me a little bit about your own family? Because, uh, you know, I'm just sort of reading a little bit about you, and it's just this fascinating story, like mine, one of migration, intercontinental migration, of, of huge challenge, but sort of, yes. of overcoming I mean, things. Um, I mean, my family... I mean, I, I actually... Um, my, my, my sort of father's family is, is Moroccan, Italian, Spanish, wow. Portuguese. Yes. Um, and my mother's family is, is basically from the Russian Empire, from Odessa, from Lithuania, from Poland. Um, so I'm an absolute mongrel um, in the best possible sense. And, uh, but the, the Montefiore family is an interesting family because um, Sir Moses Montefiore, who was sort of founder of the family fortunes, as it were, um, in the 19th century, um, was a sort of financier. He was brother-in-law with N.M. Roth, the first Roth, Lord Rothschild, the first oh. Rothschild, and um, and he travelled the world as a sort of as a, as a Britain when Brit when being Britain was the most powerful nation empire in the world, and he fought anti-Semitism everywhere. Um, so it's an interesting story. But you know, going back, they they were in Spain. They were expelled to Spain. They went to Portugal. Um, they they pretended to convert to Catholicism. Um, then Philip II hired them to go to govern part of Mexico, and then they were denounced as, um, as secret Jews, crypto-Jews, and most of them were burnt at the stake, including, um, you know, the 14-year-old girls, and the, fam the teenage girls in the family, and one of them um, escaped and, and took the name, took Italy, and made it to Italy and took the name Montefiore. That, that's what we believe is the story. Wow. So it's a very interesting story. And again, like yours, it's just... Multi-continental, yes, um, and and in some ways England has been a great blessing for us. And, and was that was that one of the things that inspired you to want to write this? Because there is something, isn't there, that set against huge change, against struggle. That there is something of the way in which family can sort of resist huge amounts of sort of pressure and. And, uh, and, and, and challenge. I think that's right. I think families have amazing flexibility and resilience, and as, your, as yours also shows. And, you know, and I think that um, that's why family is a great way of doing this, because yeah. families do change. Um, families families um, sort of mutate and evolve in a, in a way. And, it, and, of course, intermarry. I mean, one of the themes of the book is that, you know, all of history is about migration. Yes. Um, there are no real nations. There are no pure nations. There yes. are no pure families. Um, and that's one of the themes of the book. And all of history is made up of these, I mean, invasions and migrations. Invasions are when it's just men with guns yes. and swords. And migrations are, are movements that sometimes include invasions, but when the families go too. And, um, and all of them are about these families conquering, settling, merging pillaging, raping, um, but ultimately settling and merging with peoples. And that, along with, of course, empire is another great theme of, yes. of, the, of the thing. And so, so family is a neat way to do that. And my own family, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing about Britain. You know, Britain, um, we all know that the British Empire um, has, had, has, has had huge... Has, 
has committed great crimes like every empire, um, but Britain has also um, been an ex extraordinarily open as well in many ways. And so it's like, like everything, it's a nuanced story. Yes. I mean, Montefiore was an immigrant from it, a Jewish immigrant from Italy who ended up knowing Queen Victoria and wow. being knighted and given a title in his own lifetime. He was very kind of, he was very quick when he, when he met people who were anti-Jewish. Um, was, there was one occasion when he was having some dinner with a whole lot of dukes and lords, and I think it was at the, at the Duke of Kent's house. And you've got to remember, this is the early 19th century when he was a Jew with a yamulker on, you know, and this was in Britain. So sort of, it just gives you an idea that Britain, imperial Britain was slightly different than we, than we, than we sometimes think. And somebody said, somebody said, um, you know, what's, what, you know what's, this, what's this Jew doing at this dinner? And everyone went quiet. And he said, you know something, Montefiore? When I, um, I've just come back from Japan. And you know why I like Japan? Japan's very different from Britain. Because in Japan, there are no pigs and there are no Jews. So everyone went very quiet. And Moses Montefiore just said, well, then you and I should visit Japan so they have one of each. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah. And, and you've been a correspondent, you know, you've actually kind of been there when some of these, the sorts of events, the scale of events that you reflect in the book are actually playing themselves out. So, I mean, has that impacted the, uh, the, the narrative and, and the sorts of stories you chose to tell? Yeah, I mean, one thing I wanted to do was to bring it right up to date. So it ends on the day of the Ukrainian invasion. Yes. And... Um, that was a bad day, by the way, for, not just for the Ukrainians, but also for the writers of world history, because <laughs> I had planned to finish it on the day the first person died of COVID in Wuhan. Um, and it was a terrible moment when I realised I was going to have to rewrite the whole end of the book or add, you know, say, but, um, but, but that said, I mean, I, I was very lucky in my... I very, I've been very lucky in... Um, in my own lifetime, I'm, I'm, I'm 57. I think we're almost the same. We're the same age, yes. yes. Um, I, you know, I'm very lucky. That I've known some of the kind of some of the people who can appear in a world history, from Thatcher to to Kissinger to people like that, and um, and others. And you know, and I've put them in the book and my own conversations with them in the book. And I was also very lucky because when I was after university, I'd had a very boring life at boarding school and etc. As you do. And then the Soviet Union started to break up. And all my life, I'd studied Russian history. And so I just thought, like, I've got to be there for this. This is the great event of our lifetime, one of them. And so I went out there. And, um, you know, there was no way to organise a trip to go to all these places. You know, I wanted to go not just to Moscow and Leningrad, as it was, but also I wanted to go to Tbilisi and yes. Yerevan and um, Samarkand and, and Bukhara and Kat Tashkent. So I rang up a sort of... The only place I could find out to organise it was to ring up a bed and breakfast company that did trips to the Soviet Union. It was run by some communists. And I said to them, you know, I want to go to all these places. They were like, oh, my God, we've never arranged trips to anywhere except Leningrad and, um, Mos and Moscow. But, OK, we'll do it. And so I went on this amazing trip, and I stayed with families in every one of these cities. And every single city I arrived in, a coup broke out within about, <laughs> within about, within about you know, 12 hours of my arrival. And so I was in this wonderful position of being a sort of an aspiring war correspondent who, you know, was, I got to meet every president, I got to meet the warlords, the rebels, everything. I had amazing experiences. Um, and, and, you know, now I look back, I was incredibly lucky because... You know, writing a work, being a historian, but being a historian who wants to, wants to write a world history, um, there's no better training than to see a great empire falling. But were, but, but were you terrified, you know, seeing these things actually kind of yes. unfold? Yes. And the sense of... of, of but, but you continued. You I still... was always terrified. Um, I'm not a sort of brave person. But there does come over you um, a, um, a, a, an addiction to the excitement... And also um, a, feel, a feeling that when you're younger that you're um, untouchable. And also just an exhilaration of being in real danger. And, you know, I was in real danger. I was kind of... I mean, there were, I, had, I had many adventures. Um, you know, I remember... There was, there was a great... And I remember in Georgia, for example, when I, when I went to meet the president, um, Zviad Kamsakhurdia, later, later assassinated, overthrown, 
Um, he was one of the people who faced a coup as soon as I arrived in his city. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I remember seeing him and I remember talking. He was a Shakespearean scholar as well as being somewhat insane. And um, so we talked a lot about Shakespeare. And then we sort of heard gunfire, and that was the beginning of the coup. And then I went back to see him, and I was, he was besieged in his palace in Tbilisi in Georgia. And, and there was a great, um, a great moment when he said, like, I'm going to have to go and address my followers outside. But, and I said, Mr. President, I, I can't help but notice that you have the only phone in Tbilisi that works. <laughs> This was, this was in um, 1991, so it was a long time ago. And he had this kind of huge phone, this big on his desk, which was a, a satellite phone. And so I said, can I, can I phone my mum? Oh. Because um, <laughs> she doesn't know where I am and there's no way to phone out. He said, sure. He said, sit in, the th he, he said, sit in my presidential throne, he said, using the word throne. And he went out and he started shouting at the crowd. They were firing guns. And, he, and I rang my mother and she said, where the hell are you? I said, I'm in Georgia. She said... But there's a civil war going on. <laughs> I said, yes, I said, and I'm, I'm besieged with the president. Um, she said, get out of there immediately. And then she said, what's that sound in the background? She said, it sounds like, sounds like Hitler. And I said, well, it is the local dictator addressing his, um, his followers outside. So anyway, that was a couple. But, you know, I had, I had amazing, um, amazing things happen to me. I mean, if, you know, a couple of times in, 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 in Georgia and also in Chechnya, um, where I was there for the beginning of that war, um, really scary things happened where people, where you thought you were going to be killed and you get a sort of sick feeling um, coming over you. I mean, one of the interesting things about when, you know, when you read about journalists being killed in wars, which I realised from my three experiences of very nearly being killed or thinking I was about to be killed, were that the people who were very nearly killed me never really, uh, some of them never really found out who I was or never asked, they never asked my passport or my name. You know, so I was... I, that was also somewhat galling um, to think that these people hadn't even found out who you were, <laughs> but they were going to kill you kind of because you were there. And so that's quite kind of... And I remember thinking, like, I've got left nothing. I haven't written a book. I haven't ever had children, you know. And, and is that, in a way, what your work is about addressing, that sense of, of frailty that I guess we all have when we look at history and think about how we are flotsam and jetsam at yes. some level? Yeah. And that what writing something particularly as substantive as, as, as this piece, that it, it does kind of give us a sense of, of where we stand, of, 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 of something of the meaning of, of some of the sorts of huge sorts of passages of things that otherwise that seem almost to be, you know, they're, they're very difficult to deal with, you know, that thinking about, I, I looked at your, your final kind of conclusion and it's a lot of, very t difficult things, but you somehow managed to craft a positive, uplifting end to it. I think, I think all of us sort of are very aware of the transience of life. I think it's a feature of, of world history that in every age you look at in the book, you'll see that people were convinced the world was about to end. Yes. In every, of course, I, I think it's probably closer now than it ever has been before, and we can perhaps come to that. But it is a feature of human nature, and I think it's partly because our sense of guilt and fragility in our mastery of the planet um, has gives us that feeling. So, yeah, it is part of it. And, of course, you know, when I was in those situations in, in, in Grozny, um, I, did, I literally thought, my God... And one of the things I thought, <laughs> remember thinking was, like, I've been paid 200 quid for this article. Wow. By, and this is the sort of thing, you stupid thing you think about. I've been paid 200 quid for this article for the, for the New York Times or New Republic or whatever it was. And I was writing for some American... Um, organs, and I remember just thinking, like, and I'm going to be killed, and I'm, you know, for this, and I really must sort of do, you know, I must do more. So that was part of it, and I do think, I do love, I mean, but all of power is a study of transience. I mean, everyone who triumphs, who stays on top for for long, um, isn't on top forever. Every power, every empire, every leader, um, if, if for nothing else, they're destroyed by their own health, you know, their own aging. So that's part of it. I mean, I love. One of my favourite quotations in the book is that of Abdul Rahman, uh, Abdul Rahman III, um, the caliph, the first caliph of the Umayyad al-Andalus in Spain, you know, who, who was supposedly on his deathbed, said, when I look back at my 60-year reign, and it was tri a triumphant reign, he said, I can only find 14 days of happiness, oh my which God. is thoughtful. <laughs> but I also think, but to really answer your question directly, I mean, I had on my desk all the time... Um, the letter of Sima Qian, the first century BC 
um, Chinese historian who was writing a world history. And historians have a special role, a sacred role, I think, mm -hmm. um, to write the truth. And especially since, you know, I mean, I write a lot about Russia. And in the last couple of weeks, I've had messages from Moscow about the people who helped me write my Stalin books, you know, saying, we, I've just been raided. I've just, you know, I've been up all night. The secret police raided my, the FSB raided my house last night. So it's the idea, the idea that we're trying to do something sacred and right. And Sima Qian was writing this world history of China um, based around China. Um, in China, all world histories are based around China, of course. <laughs> um, the central country, as, as, as they call themselves. And, and he fell foul of the Emperor Wu, who arrested him, and um, gave him a choice. Um, death, execution, or castration. And he chose castration. And um, he finished his world history. And um, he said, you know, I chose, I chose to finish this world history um, and to face this terrible mutilation so I could finish the book. And so it'd be read in many countries. And, ladies and gentlemen, I would have made the same decision. <laughs> um, had, I, had I faced that dilemma, I would have chosen castration. And I also want to reassure you that I finished this book intact. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how did you avoid... How did you avoid that, well, as, as you suggested, of not just reflecting a Western, European, a British sensibility and perspective, and also the kind of, you know, the power of, of European histories yeah. and European perspectives upon the world. It, it's, it's something which is very difficult to resist. You know, the, how did you manage to create a history that felt like it told the story of humanity rather than just of, 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 uh, of Euro-American. Of course, that's the, that's the huge challenge. Yes. Um, I mean, one part of it is I think Africa, uh, for Africa, for example, especially North Africa, I actually think Africa's two continents, you know, in, when you deal with it historically. I mean, the sort of Saharan Africa. Yes. Um, which, uh, and West Africa, which have always been, since very, very early, been part of Eurasian history. Yes. And, um, and so, you know, I sort of see Afro-Eurasia as really one block, um, you know, not really counting Central and Southern Africa, but including very much um, West Africa and yes. especially North Africa. So um, that, that is natural, but it's been hugely neglected traditionally. And one of the rules, I, I told you, the first rule was about the families, which I told you, just, you know, um, treat, treat the Zulu family exact, exactly as you would treat the Habsburgs. Yes. Um, and the second one is, you know, never, um, never um, introduce any place, any country, any kingdom through the eyes of some Spaniard turning up first or an Englishman turning up, and which, which happens, by the way, even in the most progressive history yes. that you read, the most anti anti-imperial modern histories, that still happens. I did, I, I was, I was, I, so every time you meet the Inca dynasty, um, uh, you know, the Dahomeans or whatever, you will meet them first, you know, on, in their own, on their own account. And these are sort of details, but they matter. In but history. writing this in lockdown, how did you do that research? How did um, you...? I mean, and, and then the other, th I mean, the other part of it is that, um, is that, you know, I always, I always wanted to write this book. I always wanted to write a world history. I've always been much more interested in the history of Southern Africa or, or you know, Asia than I have been in write, reading it about Britain. And the Tudors are banned in the book, really. <laughs> um, so, I mean, they, they, of course, they take, they take their place. But, I mean, just to answer your question about... Uh, before I get to the question about the research... I just, yes. I mean, it's one idea that you know, gives, you the, gives you the idea of the sort of priorities in a book like this. I mean, in 1415, we all know in Britain, this is the year uh, you know, of Agincourt. Yes. Um, when you look at Agincourt, Agincourt, is, you know, which is a key battle in English history, we've all, we all virtually feel we were there. But actually, the, 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 the armies at Agincourt were tiny. I mean, they were somewhere between five and eight, maybe ten at the most, thousand people. Yes. In you know, just a few years earlier, um, the, you know, the battle between the battle between um, Tamerlane and um, Bayezid, the Ottoman Sultan, the Abu Padisha, you know, the armies are as big as two hundred thousand each. Well, yes, yes. And so you can see why, in my book, um, you know th that that struggle is in the is in the text, and 
you know, Henry V and, and Agincourt are in, are in, the, in the footnote. Um, but, you know, researching it was extremely difficult. And, you know, it, it's a terrifying feeling that you have to master all these different subjects. Where I was helped was I didn't really have many researchers. I started off with a wonderful, one wonderful researcher, and then she had a baby, uh, which is appropriate for family history, of course, <laughs> but then she was not able to help me anymore. So I did it, but, but I've learned from my books, really doing it all yourself is the only way to do it. Wow. Um, because I've got an eye for what I, I want. To, all these books are really written for what amuses me and interests me. Um, but what I did have was I wrote, at the end of the book, I wrote to the world expert on every subject, wow. whatever it was, yes. um, whether it was Ming China or, um, or, or you know, or, or, the, um, or, or the Aztec kingdom or whatever. And I wrote to them and I said, could you... You know, I could you, um, you have to sort of, I had to be incredibly flattering. I said, like, I'm, you know, I've got your book beside me, um, which I normally did. And, um, and I said, you know, please, can you read this stuff? And, of course, some of them just say, get lost. Some of them write back incredibly <laughs> rude corrections, you know, saying you shouldn't really be attempting this. This is a terrible, this is an outrage. And I know the feeling when I get, because I get sent books on Stalin and the, the Romanov dynasty and Catherine the Great all the time. And sometimes I'm just outraged <laughs> by the idiocies of people write and send to me. But I've been incredibly lucky. I, I'm one of those people who, though you have to have a certain sort of, um, uh, you have to have a certain sort of, I suppose, amor propre to even attempt a book like this. I've never minded being corrected by cleverer people. And so... I've, I was incredibly fortunate in my life to have wonderful teachers. And, you know, when I, my first book, Catherine the Great and Potemkin, um, I had an amazing woman called Professor de Isabel de Madriaga, a name almost as splendid as ours. <laughs> and she, um, uh, she was a fascinating character. I mean, she was, she was an expert on Catherine the Great. And she, she really inspired my book because she said there's no biography of the partnership of Catherine and Potemkin. And so somebody should write it one day. When I was, when I was doing my... Uh, we're studying the enlightened, enlightened despotism. I read that. I thought, like, I'm going to do that one day. So I, and I did. And so she very strictly told me to, to how to write books. And um, I literally sat at her feet. She was an incredibly grand woman in her 70s by then. She looked exactly like Catherine the Great. In fact, I think she was. She thought <laughs> she was Catherine the Great. And when I went to see... When I went to... When I went and researched the book and I went to visit the tomb of Potemkin... Um, which is in Kherson in Ukraine. Yes. We, th there hangs a tale, if we have time. <laughs> yeah. And um, when I went to visit, she said, will you lay um, a bouquet of red roses on his tomb? And I realised that she really did think she was Catherine the Great, and she was <laughs> in love with Prince Potemkin. Um, so I did deliver that. And, of course, you know, Prince Potemkin is a fascinating relevant, has a fascinating relevance now because President Putin has actually stolen that body and taken it back to Russia. Um, which, which is pretty fascinating. Yes. We, we're going to open up in a moment, but just uh, the book has some interstitial moments in which you talk about the population at different periods in, yes. in his... Uh, and the exponential, the terrifying growth of, of populations. I mean, did, did, I mean, did you have kind of particular con conclusions that you could draw just from... Yeah. That as a graph, that just as a yes, trajectory. I mean, that is one of the most. That is one of the most important things in it. And of course, that's. I mean, a lot of that is to do with medicine, and you know, the, I'm a doctor's son and grandson and nephew, so I'm fascinated with medicine. So the book is filled with medical advances and med doctors. And as you said at the beginning, um, this is a book not just about um, royal dynasties, but dynasties of doc families of doctors and lawyers and and. Executioners. By the way, I just saw that. Did you just see that they just found the the, the notebook of Pierpont, the English, ex the British executioner who executed about five hundred people um, in the early part of the twentieth century? And it reminds me of one of my favourite dynasties is um, the Sanson dynasty, the, yes. the hereditary executioners of France, who first of all used axe and wheel to break people, but then but then adapted during the French Revolution to, of course, the guillotine, where they were killing hundreds of people a day. And one of the executioners, um, one of the Saint-Saëns, slipped on the blood, because he was executing so many people, he was exhausted, and he slipped on the blood, fell off the guillotine, 
hit his head and was killed. <laughs> Which just tells you, is an occupational, occupational hazard. <laughs> you are going to be executing way too many people a day. And I'll tell you another occupational hazard, which I also love. In the book, there are many, many monarchs who use poison to, execute, to kill people, and which is a very useful... Poison is very useful. It's the family or court way to kill people because there's always doubt about whether they have or haven't been poisoned. Um, and Baibars, the founder, sultan who has founded the Mamluk kingdom oh, yes. in, of Egypt, um, which is a big part of the book, born a slave, by the way, you know, rose to general and then sultan, so he literally went from slave to king. Pretty amazing. But he, he often poisoned people, his guests. It's a very neat way to deal with problems. But, it, but an occupational hazard is one day he absentmindedly was about to poison one of his guests when he drank the cup himself. <laughs> and which is very much an occupational hazard if you do poison your guests. Um, but but just, to, I mean, just to answer that population, medicine is absolutely key to the book. Um, the, you know, the, the, the sort of the improvements in medicine and nutrition in the last 150 years obviously changed world history. I mean, one of the interesting things is that you'll see that in the second part of the 20th century, um, and, and really in the whole 20th century, famines became much less common. Yes. Um, they, really only, they, 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 they really only happened in wartime um, or as, as a result of direct political decisions or policies as happened in Ethiopia and Stalin's, um, Stalin's famine in, in Ukraine and the Soviet Union. Um, so, so that was a hugely important part of the story. And, you know, you, you realise that, um, you know, West Africa is about... I mean, the population picture of the world now is about to change radically. Yes. Um, you know, originally it was predicted that Nigeria would be the second biggest country in the world, and it may not... With, with almost a billion people within 50 years, which, yes. is, which is terrifying. Um, it should mean that Nigeria... It just adds to the fact that Nigeria is, you know, well-positioned to be a continental, if not a superpower. Yes. But obviously, it requires great government, you know, a, a huge improvement in governance to achieve that. Yeah. And I don't know if that's ever going to happen, judging by the latest election. <sighs> yes. But... But, um, but there's going to be a huge switch in populations, and that's going to make migration, again, a hugely important challenge, which we're really not facing up to yet. But that's very much a subject for the conclusion. Mm. But my last question before we open up um, to our audience, but also if you're at home, please do um, send us um, a question online. And, th and that is that you choose the Rolling Stones' Sympathy for the Devil, as you say that's the greatest history strong ever written. And I just wondered, what about Bon M, Ra Ra Rasputin? I mean, oh, that that's a very good <laughs> that, Well, that's your best, most important <laughs> question by far. Russia's greatest, greatest love, machine. love machine. I mean, how, I mean, um, how on earth? Yeah. I mean, other than that, I mean, this is a great, great, great kind of uh, yeah. piece of... Yeah, well, well I, mean, I mean, one of the great things about writing about family is to get the feeling of life. So this book is filled with food and sex and poetry and and, and love and the things that make family as well, and music. Yes. Um, one of the fun things about the music is that, you know, some, some musicians um, really were kind of part, of part of history and high politics. I mean, the best example, I mean, of course, Elvis is in there and, um, and, uh, and um, people like that, the Stones, David Bowie is in there. But, of course, the, most, the best example is, is, is Frank Sinatra. Because Frank Sinatra, you know... Um, the Mafia in the book, and in 1946, he sung at the Mafia conference of Lucky Luciano, Maya Lansky and Bugsy Siegel in Havana, uh, of all places. And then he became very close to the Kennedys, and he introduced Marilyn Monroe to the Kennedy brothers. That went well, of course. <laughs> um, then he introduced Judith Exner, who was the lover of... Um, Sam Giancana, the mafia boss, godfather of Chicago, and that didn't go that well either. But then he managed to. Be, then he was. Then he was great friends with, with Reagan, Ronald Reagan, and he sung at. You know, he organised his inauguration. So there's a world historical figure. So when I was listening to the book, I listened to all this music. Wow. And um, and you know, I began to realise that there's a great fun thing looking at these his, what I call history songs. Yeah. A history song, is either a song that is about history, like the two you mentioned, or, um, or, or is, is, is sort of a song that is the sort of theme song of a history moment, like The Winds of Change, the, the song by the Scorpions about the fall of the 
Berlin Wall, for example. Yes. So this, so I, made, so I decided I'm going to have the first history book with a soundtrack. And so on Spotify, the world has a soundtrack <laughs> of the greatest history songs. Oh, and it's wow. like, and I, so I, I would love you all to listen to it and choose, see if I've got, if I've missed anything out. But it has, it's not, it can't just be a book about history. It also has to be a good song to go in the list. Now, I chose the Rolling Stones um, uh, partly because um, Mick Jagger is, always, is a great reader of history books and has read all my books. Oh, wow. Um, bit of name-dropping there, forgive me. <laughs> um, but also because um, it is, I think, a masterpiece because the lyrics are so clever. Because to pretend you're the devil, yes. um, you know, um, guess my name... Um, please, and, and, you know, and, and the words are superb. You know, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. Yes. And then he goes on to, you know, drive a tank, held a general's rank, and he, he does all the most terrible crimes. You know, World War II, the killing of the Kennedys, the Rom killing of the Romanovs, and they're all in the book. So it was a perfect... So it, I, made it the, I made it my number one in, the, um, in my playlist, my world playlist. But Ra Ra Rasputin is a very important work. <laughs> And <laughs> Russia's, yeah, Russia's race, greatest love machine. Exa Except, I think yeah. Potemkin was, his, was Russia's greatest love machine. <laughs> so it contains at least one factual mistake. OK. And the other mistake... <laughs> but, but I, by the way, on Twitter, you know how humourless Twitter is a lot of the time? <laughs> I've had a lot of people writing me and saying, like, but this, this, book, this, this song is not accurate. You know, <laughs> um, Napoleon, you know, Napoleon um, did not actually surrender at Waterloo and things like, you know, about, about Abba's Waterloo. And so, you know, I just explained this. But it doesn't have to be completely accurate. But Rara Asputin, though it does also contain the line, you know, lo lover of the Russian queen, and I don't think the Rasputin ever actually was lover of um, Empress Alexandra. However, I do think that Rara Aspin is one of the great historical analyses of all time. <laughs> um, it's a key historical source. And I would also say, if anyone wants to understand earlier 20th century court politics at the, at the court of the last Romanov Tsar, that is Bonier, an excellent, that is an excellent source <laughs> and an essential um, material for you to study. Fantastic. Well, with that, we're, we'll, can we open it up, uh, a question here? Um, Mike. Some fantastic 40-minute songs about the First World War. Just <laughs> okay. When you were doing your research, Simon, when you were looking at these big families, how much did you come across what lives were like for ordinary families who were often ruled by these bigger people, and how much did the ordinary and the less ordinary kind of interplay with each other? It's a very good question, and um, it's a very relevant question. I mean, as I said, it, there are enslaved families in this book who were followed um, through, through the book. Um, and there were royal families who were the most privileged people on earth. Um, so there is literally high and low in the book. Um, but, but I should say, um, there are also many, many professions, many, many um, ordinary families um, who for some reason or other we have source material on and so we can write about. On the other hand, um, I'm, a, I'm a historian of power. And most of my books are about the rulers. Um, and so this isn't a book about ordinary people. Though it's also, I mean, when I talked about family at the beginning of this discussion, it's a book about ruling families, but it's also about family. So, for example, you know, there's an enormous amount about how family, the family unit of ordinary people has changed throughout history. Something that is affected by religion, working habits, economy, and, of course, healthcare massively, um, and, of course, cultural mores. So, so there's a lot of ordinary, ordinary people in the book, in fact, <laughs> and I hope it satisfies you. <laughs> and there's a question that's come in um, online. Um, was there anything about any of these ruling dynasties that you found particularly surprising? Yeah, I mean, I found everything surprising about it. There are so many things I learned that I didn't know. But what I, what, I've took, what I took great pleasure in, most of all, was just the importance of women in families. The, and, and, you know, in one way, this book is really a book in praise of motherhood. It's a, bo it's a book about mothers. Um, one of the things I was, I was you know, I, we were taught as children in our school, and I don't know if this is true of, of you, Gus, is we were always taught that um, Hitler and Stalin only were monsters because... Um, they were beaten by drunken fathers, and, um, and they were mad. And so, you know, that is a very unuseful analysis. But 
you know, and, and it's even more unuseful because everyone in the 19th century was beat, were beaten by their fathers. <laughs> um, but what, it was in, what was interesting about it was the mothers. And both of them were absolutely worshipped and adored by their, by their mothers. And when you look at Hitler's upbringing, when you analyse it, I mean, the father was, yes, the father was a bit of a bully, but, you know, he was very much a man of his time. But the mother worshipped Hitler, indulged him, adored him. He, be, you know, so he became Hitler from an excess of confidence, yeah. fostered, nourished and nurtured by maternal love. So there's a lesson for all wow. parents, <laughs> all mothers out there. But, you know, but the, but, the, but the influence of women, I mean, just to give you a very quick example, this question is a nice question. I mean, in the early sort of 17th century, you know, in England, all we read about is, you know, James I, Charles I, Cromwell, who are all in the book, of course, and, and are very important, especially the Cromwells, who are fascinated by. But, um, but, you know, we sort of feel that England's the centre of the world, and this is what's wrong with the traditional history. And, you know, I was, fasc I was very surprised to find out that, it, that it, during the entirety of that period, which is about 50 years the most important person in the world was a woman called Kossam, Kossam Sultan, who was the, the widow of um, Sultan, pa the Padisha of the Ottoman Empire. At the time when the Ottoman Empire stretched from, basically, from the borders of Morocco all the way to the borders of Iran and all of, all of, the, and all of, kind of the Balkans as well, um, and all of Iraq, massive, um, massive empire. She was actually dominant, you know, um, making her sons um, the, um, the, the emperor, removing sons. I mean, she had to make some terrible decisions. I mean, she had to have one of her, agree to have her son, Ibrahim the Mad, strangled, which is a very difficult decision for any parent to make. Um, <laughs> but, but you'll find out in the book why, you know, in the end, she sort of saw sense of making it. But the point is, you know, we live in such a sort of Anglo-centric world um, and actually, and actually, this woman was actually the most important person in the world, or one of the two or three, and we've never heard of her. Mm. So she's a really important person in the book, and that's why it's fun to write a diverse book, to write a book that looks at women. And, and social mobility as something that... Yes. Because, I mean, it's natural that we want to see the progress of people that we are close to and related to, and that that, that sits in slight tension with us allowing for a throughput of some of the sorts of people who might be marginalised in... in, in well, well that, that's exactly right. And you'll find in the book um, many, many people of colour who appear in surprising places. You know, yes. the first general... The first black general in Europe was, was promoted by Peter the Great. Yes. You know, Gen General yes. Hannibal. Yes. Um, the first black general, biracial general in Western Europe was General Duma. Yeah. The, grand, the, the father of Alexander Duma, the, um, the, the, the writer. And Hannibal was, was and, and then Pushkin was, of course, a descendant of General Hannibal. So there are lots of these surprising and interesting characters um, in the book, and that's one of the great joys. But the woman I was talking about, Kossem, yes. Yes. was an enslaved woman. And that is the fascinating thing. When you were talking about you know, people not just covering the high, pe high people, of course... You know, most of the people enslaved by um, Crimean Tatar raids into Russia and Ukraine um, did not become the ruler of the largest empire in the world. And so in some ways we're talking with exceptional people. But it is a fascinating thing, isn't it, that this girl, stolen from her family at age six or seven or 12 or something, who she never saw again or heard from again, they were probably killed during the raid. She was taken, she was sold as a sex slave um, or, or, what, or to be whatever, from one person to another, and then placed in the harem, uh, and placed in the harem of the emperor, the Ottoman emperor. And then he notices her, he marries her. And so one, one's re one reminded how complex these questions, these nuanced questions are, mm. and, how, um, and how things are a lot more complicated than just say one civilization is good, one civilization is bad. And I try not to do that. I try not to follow any ideology in the book. Mm. I reject the old sort of imperial ideologies of sort of hero worshipping, um, pith-helmeted imperial heroes. But I also reject, you know, the, the, the new ideology too. And, you know, our job is, as, as historians is to try and get as close as to the truth and to cover everybody, victims, victims and perpetrators, 
everyone counts or no one counts. And, and do you feel optimistic? Because a lot of a lot of the sorts of passages of the history that you that you relate to us it, are really difficult to deal with, and it's it's holding the mirror up to us and making us take responsibility for, you know, as a as a as a race that we have we haven't necessarily kind of dealt with opportunity well. And I just wonder how you feel. Do you feel optimistic about um, the future? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, that, that is my mission, to show everything um, and not to follow any program about how to, how to have a hierarchy of victims, for example. Yes. Um, but really to show everybody that I can, you know, um, and, to, and, to, and I do believe that of the crimes of the past, I mean, the best thing is to try the people, you know, as we did at Nuremberg, um, you know, in their lifetimes. Um, but I do think that, that ultimately the best revenge is, the best redemption is to shine, is to illuminate everything yeah. um, without, without favour, um, without sparing, the, you know, all national pride. Yes. Um, but also placing everything in the correct perspective. I mean, for example, you know, a lot of the discussion about British Empire, all of the, every, virtually every crime the British Empire committed is, by the way, is in this book. But um, the French Empire, you know, which had no monarchy for much of it, um, you know, was, is, very, is, is, is almost exactly the same in its mm. history and, had, and, and, and conquered an empire that's almost the same size. And it's really impossible to understand the British Empire without understanding the Dutch or French or Spanish empires too. Um, am I, am I, am I um, optimistic or pessimist? I mean, this book is filled with the most terrible thing, yeah. as, you, as you know. It's filled with, with killings and tortures, um, wars. And it, it, one reason, just in a, it, very quickly, but one reason why wars are so important, and th this book is filled with violence, is because, as you've seen in Ukraine, you know, war is the great super propellant of change. And, you know, things can remain the same for for a long time, to paraphrase, to paraphrase Lenin, you know, you know, nothing's happens for years and then years happen in weeks, you know. And so you've seen in Ukraine how that has changed the entire, tilted the world. And that's because everything, you know, new discoveries, technical advances, ingenuity, um, the inter you know, all systems are tested by wars and crises, pandemics. So they're very important. And the book is filled with them. Mm. But it's also filled with all the poetry and beautiful writing and art that I could find. It's filled with artists, in fact. Yeah. And it's a great celebration, I mean, of human kindness and love as well. And, you know, we are at a more dangerous time um, than we've ever been for and all do you think of every, Do you think every era that they say that, or do you think that there are, there's, general, there's think, genuine kind of empirical... I think, we are, I think we are in a more dangerous situation than we've ever been before. I mean, there's climate change, of course. Um, but, you know, there's also um, nuclear weapons and the ingenuity of weaponry now. And, you know, I, it is a bit like um, Chekhov's famous comment about theatre. You know, he said, if you, go to, if you go to a play and there's a gun on the wall, um, someone's going to get shot during the play. And, um, and that is true with, with, nuclear, with, with nuclear weapons. So, so I do think we are in, in a time of great danger. But I also think, um, I believe that ingenuity and flexibility um, of, of, human, of humankind, and we should celebrate that. This book's a celebration of it, and I do think um, you know, we will come through it. Is five or so minutes left. Is there other questions? That, uh, please. Uh, can, I so can you wait for the microphone? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, two questions, if I may. Um, the first is, how do you decide upon which book you are going to write next? And my next part is, what's your next book? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The, now, you, now you put me on the spot. Um, how do I decide on the books? I mean, with this book, I'd always wanted to write it. And, um, and you know, I, I, I sort of, my, my father gave me a world history when I was very little. And he said, in his rather sort of gentle way, he said, um, you know, maybe you'll write something like this one day. And I always wanted to, because I've always followed um, Benjamin Disraeli's dictum. He always said, Dizzy always said, who's a bit of a hero of mine, and is a big character in the book, but he always said, you know, when I want to read a book and I can't find it, I write it. 
um, which, and I followed the Disraeli dictum. You know, normally I, I try and write a book that hasn't been written before and that I, I think I can do. Um, but, you know, it was a sort of leap of faith of whether I could, do, you know, survive writing this one. So I decided to do it because I'd written a, a book about Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, the, my history of Jerusalem, the history of Jerusalem, the biography, is a sort of history of the European, Euro, Eurasian world, of the Abrahamic faith. So it's a sort of um, Europe and West Asia. And, um, and I loved doing that. And so I thought, like, well, OK, I've done a sort of, you know, Disraeli also said, the, history of the history of Jerusalem is the history of the world. So I thought, like, maybe I should do the history of the world. And, and I have. And I've survived it to tell you about it. <laughs> Which, by the way, is the fun bit, because writing it is terrible. It's hell. But the best bit is talking about it um, on stage with charming people and talking, going around. And I'm going around the world now talking about this book everywhere, really. And, and, what, and how have you felt the... the the reaction has been from historians, um, from historians. It's been so far, so far. I mean, it's just, it's about to come out in America, which is, which I would, would you know, um, I, I tell you, you know, you never get over the, um, you never get over the, ter the, the sort of trepidation of reviews and the longing for fairness in people reading books and, you know, be giving, having the generosity to know how hard it is to write. Uh, but I haven't decided what to do next, but I'm going to do a lot of fiction now. I mean, my next big history book is The Big Three, um, which, you know, the, the relationship. It's a sort of triple biography of Churchill, Stalin and Roosevelt. Um, but, you know, who knows where we'll all be when I finally write that? Because <laughs> I'm now going to do a lot of fiction and dig scripts and people are making films of a lot of my books, which is very exciting. Are you very cheeky? Are you going to um, make a TV series of this book? Wow. Um, yeah, we're trying to. <laughs> yes, we're trying to. We're trying to make a TV series. I mean, we sold it to um, A and E Network in um, in the states. So, so we may well do that. Um, and I hope. I, I hope. I, I love making my TV series. And people always said to me, you know, did you have? Did you ever write a book about Spain or Rome or the places that I made these my TV series for the Beeb about? And I never did. But all of them have gone into this book. And one of the joys of the book is putting in people I've met but putting in all the places I've been to. Um, you know, I've been virtually everywhere. So, and I've stayed in many of the houses or visited many of the houses and palaces that I write about. So that's, that's a lot of fun, so I really hope so. That's a nice question, thank you. But that was three questions. <laughs> it was, it was. <laughs> oh, well, that's good. Well, I love teachers, <laughs> love teachers. Oh, but Simon, thank you so much. It's just thank been you. such a treat. We, same hairstyle, born in the same year, yeah. equally long and complex yeah. names yes. and, 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 and family, family histories. histories. And to talk about. Yes, and I absolutely enjoyed the last hour, but also I have absolutely enjoyed the last week, which I've dedicated huge amounts to reading this particular book. And if you haven't read it, please do get out there and buy it and read it. It's, it is such a wonderful read and when you do finish it you think gosh that is important not just in terms of the brilliance with which it's written but also it leaves you with a sense of of how we need to contribute to making the changes that we would like to see but it's been such a pleasure to to meet you and to speak to you Simon and huge congratulations an important book but also one which is beautifully, beautifully written. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thanks for having Time me. Thank you, Thank you so much.